So the Fallout TV show came out, and I, I amongst many others, were very happy about how the show came out. We think it kind of it really expanded on some of the laws, some areas that we maybe hadn't heard much before, especially a little bit more kind of the pre-war stuff. And it also gave us, for realistic, I think one of the first times was some actual decent law in terms of kind of the cross between the East and West about how they're interacting with one another. And especially, I think, the most important part is the Brotherhood of Steel and about how the East Coast interact with the West Coast. Now, in the past, we've had some loose information about how they've interacted with one another, about what they think of one another. However, to get a full interaction between them is something a bit more kind of than we'd expect. Now, the premise of this video is going to be, as you probably see from the title, is... The Brother of Steel airship we see in the Fallout TV show is not the Cass Wenin as we're led to believe in the kind of the pre-marketing, but it's actually the Pridwin from Fallout 4. Not only that, but I think because of that, realistically, it is quite likely Brother of Steel will now have superiority in kind of in the Boston region. However, that will form kind of the first part of my, my video, so or the second part. So this will I'll, I'll kind of continue to break down into what, what this video will be about based on that information. So the first section will be kind of covering what is the Brother of Steel looking like? What Essentially, what, what does this mean? If the Brother of Steel airship is the Pridwin, as it kind of shows in the show, and kind of what, why do I think that realistically? The second part, we'll kind of be going into a bit more kind of lore-wise, what's well, a little bit interesting, and kind of our previous interactions and kind of why they might have done that. Three, we jump fully into kind of theory and jump into my kind of larger um, Arthur Max and where is he at? So that'll be a bit more theory-based. So first of all, the reason why I think the, I think it's the Pridwin in the Fallout TV show is, I think, quite a good bit of reasoning. So actually on the side of the ship, if you look really closely and I'll put a picture above, you can see it says the Pridwin on the side of the ship. It says very big, the or it says Pridwin. So I think that's very strong evidence. Um, there's been some conjecture. Some people suggest that actually it was them scanning, it was them scanning the model and assuming that it was just part of the, uh, the, the cow for the ship. Um, I think we're going to butcher that word, actually. I think decal. We'll ignore that part. I disagree. I think it's one of these things where if it was some kind of stray flag here or maybe a, a cut or a slice to the kind of the, the armour there, it would be more understandable. But something's big as the name on the side of the ship. A name is, a name is very significant. Um, and we'll also get into kind of why it wouldn't just be just a, a spur of a name choice or anything like that and about how you can't just... It's not just a class of ship either. Now... The important thing as well is that some people some people pointed out that actually in the art so the name Pridwin comes from King Arthur mythology realistically or King Arthur legends, and the idea is that the Pridwin is that it was the name of his ship. However, the name Caswenin is actually was another name for King Arthur's ship. So the fact that they gave it then Caswenin in the pre-release, I think Venichink suggests that it was an intentional misleading to make us think it wasn't a Pridwin, and then the show to fully announce it. So I think it's quite realistic actually that it was always intended to be the Pridwin. The pre-release was just a misdirection of saying it's the cast went in when the name is actually used to refer to the same ship that the Pridwin was inspired from. Now, some people might be saying, well, the Pridwin could be the class of ship. It could be just the, the airship type. Maybe they said the Pridwin did so well, we're going to call it a new category of airships. That wouldn't really be the case. So the actual Pridwin itself wasn't actually under um, Arthur Maxon's command until a few years after its construction. Arthur actually christened the ship with, with the name Pridwin when he took command of it. Um, and obviously he did do, do the inspiration of kind of the King Arthur legends. Um, it's, it's possible that it's also just a, it was a clever little link with his own name. Um, so it, it was made all the reason to do it. So it's not just some random name. It was very specifically given by Arthur Maxon when he took command of the ship. So these are my reasons why I think it's the, why I think realistically that happened. And obviously I think what that means is, is that, well, it's very clear that either the Minutemen ending happened where the Brother Shield ship doesn't get destroyed, or... The Brother of Steel prevailed on on the East Coast in Boston in kind of the conflict there. I think that proves now canonically that nor the Institute or the Institute nor the railroad succeeded because both those endings rely on the Brother of Steel's um, main flagship, the Pridwin, being destroyed. And it seems based on based on the fact that you wouldn't let your enemy rebuild a ship once you conquered them. There's no way the ship could have been rebuilt within the nine years between Fallout Four and the show. And cross the, gone across the country. There's no way that could have happened in a way that they it was destroyed and they managed to rebuild it because an enemy would not allow that to happen. They could only rebuild it the first time after the enclave had been wiped out, and there's no one to oppose them at the time in in Washington D.C. So if we now assume that the Brother Steel or the Minutemen won, what I would likely go with and suggest is that 
either the brothers to your ending was the purely the win they took they took the lead or there's some sort of alliance between the Minutemen and the Brotherhood, which would make sense. Arthur Maxon has been known to be someone who kind of reach across and make agreements. He actually brought together the outcasts into the more kind of uh, into the core ca- chapter in the on the East Coast in a way that his predecessor couldn't. So it's possible that he managed to bridge that gap and make an alliance with them to basically say, for, in the interest of the Commonwealth, let us join together and, and basically join forces and maybe have brought them into his own ranks, almost kind of appealing to their more local protection interests in exchange of obviously the a much larger territory-based control that Brotherhood of Brotherhood can offer. Not only that, but to send a, uh, essentially their flagship airship across the country, they must have had quite strong um, dominance over the region, to the point where if the Minutemen did win and they just got scraped or the Minutemen did have supreme control, would they have been comfortable to send the Pridwin across country, removing themselves from probably one of their largest strategic units? I don't think that's the case. Now let's talk about, about the Pridwins. The Pridwin itself is obviously... It's not only symbolic, and obviously is a kind of a showing of the brother's might, as we saw in Fallout 4, its entrance was very significant in the way that it kind of announced their presence. But the Pridwin itself is a very powerful strategic item. So where obviously controlling certain locations is very important to kind of hold a region, the airship can be almost a portable strategic point, where hovering over a particular area gives them dominance over the region, because it can deploy um, vertibirds, infantrymen, power armor soldiers, to the point where they can essentially take control of an area very quickly once if they move it across into the region. So by kind of removing that out of kind of the Boston territory, they must have such control over the region that losing it is not going to cost them the region itself. To the point where I think the Brothers of Steel likely have largely dominance over the area to the point where there's nothing now to challenge them, especially not the Institute. So in the past, relations between the East and the West Coast have been quite strained. Um, up until kind of quite recently, up until essentially four or four times, we heard that the West Coast had largely given up on the East Coast. They saw kind of the um, Arthur Maxon's predecessor, Owen Lyons, as being too too hum- too humanitarian and that he cared too much about the plight of the superbians on the waste, the Wastelanders, and that he was a lost cause. He wasn't re- um, procuring and um, protecting technology he was, as he was meant to, as their directive, and essentially they thought, not worth their effort anymore. It was only when Arthur Maxon kind of came to power that they realised that they saw, essentially, his his ancestor in him. So Arthur Maxon is a descendant of the founder of the Brotherhood of Steel, Roger Maxon. So obviously he has a, a, a default respect because of that from the people around him. And from a very young age, Arthur Maxon carved himself out as a very kind of almost mythical figure within the Brotherhood of Steel, um, with the fact that he defeated a death claw at the age by 14, um, single-handedly, um, and only got a scratch across his face in the um, in the, the battle. Then in his later years, he sing- he d- um, directly took out the leader of the kind of super mutants at the time, um, Shepard, who was leading up the DC super mutants as a big revolt or big uprising against the Brotherhood of Steel control of the region. And he again, with his lead, they defeated Shepard and the forces of the super mutants. And as I said earlier, he also brought the outcasts who were the more kind of dogmatic Brother Steel members who had split across, split away from his predecessor's chapter. He brought them back into the fold by showing that he can kind of meet that kind of middle where he does focus again on technology as the Brotherhood of Steel meant to, to procure and secure, procure and secure technology, but also to have that humanitarian aspect that his predecessor was known for. He had that unique blend that brought them back into the fold, but didn't alienate anyone else who was still in that sort of um, avenue of thought. So Arthur Maxson to the point was was respected to the point where the West Coast were aware of his kind of feats and they themselves named him Elder after obviously own lines had um, passed and so did his daughter Sarah Lyons who was to surpass him. So in the absence of any decent Elder, um, Arthur Maxson was named by the West Coast as who they thought should be Elder, which again, he was probably the, one of the youngest Elders they've had. So it was a very unique position to be in where he very quickly assumed and took control of the, the East Coast Brothers deal because of his feats both on a um, on a civil front but also from a kind of a battle front. So what does this bring us to now? The West Coast, by the time we hear of them at Fallout 4, were largely being defeated. Um, the NCR push, were pushing into their bunkers and were essentially breaching them and attacking them to the point where the NCR were practically winning the region. The Brothers of Steel were largely on retreat and were pretty much failing. Now, this doesn't match up, as you're probably saying, from the show. The show suggests that Actually, the Brothers of Steel are winning. They have the they have the region. It seems they have air superiority. They seem to have land superiority. There's no one who seems to be challenging them realistically. And even in the last episode, they seem to be pretty much dominating the area. And that would be correct. 
And the reason why I think that is, is because they've largely reunited with their Eastern counterparts. And either through reinforcements, or if anything, it's just a rallying call, they've managed to push back against the NCR. So the NCR losing Shady Sands was likely a big weakness for the NCR, but the NCR is still a large force and would have not just kind of backed down easily. So I think kind of the, the resurgence with the support of the East Coast definitely helped them have that sort of come, come back. And I think the resurgence on the East Coast is further backed up by the Pridwin being on the West Coast to provide that support, but also as a symbol of the East Coast's current strength. Now, I told you the next bit would get a bit theory-based. So what does this all mean? The Pridwin is on the West Coast, providing support from the East Coast, and they now seem to be reconnected. So what? So this is interesting, I think, for a couple of reasons. One, the Pridwin is on the West Coast, which is Arthur Maxon's flagship, um, and would only be there if the, east, the Brothers Steel on the East were doing very, very well. B, the East Coast and the West Coast seem to be getting along now, which is something we're seeing as being possible. C, it's interesting as well to note that they have clerics now, um, which is a, a relatively new position, which shows that the Brothers have become very religious-based. Now, what does this mean, in my opinion? I think, now hear me out, that Arthur Maxon is the High Elder of the Brotherhood of Steel. So High Elder is the supreme leader of the entire Brotherhood of Steel, and usually it's held by positions on the West Coast. So Roger Maxon, who is the founder of the Brotherhood of Steel, would have been the first High Elder. And obviously we've heard of a few different figures, a lot of them have been Maxons, um, until obviously there's not been known what the High Elder was for the longest time. Um, likely due to kind of the NCR's kind of push against Brother Steel, there was, it's not really, it's been kind of muddied the waters about who exactly is running the, the Brother Steel on the whole. So, so why do I think that's Arthur Maxon? So Arthur Maxon, when we hear of him in Fallout 4, we hear that he's essentially being worshipped on the West Coast because of his feats. He's such a mythical figure that they seem almost like a, some, a saint, that he's, he's such a revered figure, to the point where the, the kind of the elders back on the West Coast say that they're, they're bragging the fact that they're kind of wiping out cults out of worshipping him, and they say they worship him as a god. Now, that's interesting for the fact that the brothers still seem to become not only more unified, but more religious turning, because nothing unifies a group like faith. And I think they need a faith in something. Brothers still have always been quasi-religious, but in the kind of the purpose they had of procuring, securing technology. But I think having reverence of someone like Arthur Maxon, seen as such a unique mythical figure, descendant of the founder of the Brotherhood of Steel, defeating Death Claws at such a young age, wiping out Superman uprisings, and managing to unite the Brotherhood in times of strife. I think coming together in kind of some sort of religious reverence of such a figure is likely was the reason the Western East Coast have not only managed to kind of bounce, bind together again, but have seen a resurgence in both regions in strength. Because Arthur Maxon is such a kind of a, a revereable um likable but also a very respectful character who's able to bridge together dogmatic and pragmatic regions um as obviously the west coast was very dogmatic the east coast are very pragmatic and they've now i think come together with him sending support forces and a rallying call in himself as a religious revereable figure and that to get in that sort of mindset of kind of with the clerics or worshipping him in the faith of him and also it's noted from the fact in the show that the highest clerics on the, in the Commonwealth were giving orders to the West Coast, which again is, a, is suggesting that the East Coast seem to be able to give orders to the West Coast, something we've not seen before. I think based on all of this, it's things very clear that Arthur Maxon has become the High Elder. The West Coast, or the, the West Coast is now being controlled by the East Coast in terms of who's in charge. And I think together they're now working more closely to push back against threats like the NCR, like threats that might come up in the future on the West East Coast, and that together, especially under Arthur Maxon, we'll likely see more of him in the show, leading either coming off the Pridwin, or essentially being more of a kind of a, a character we'll see again, leading the Brotherhood either from the front and the helm as they deal with threats in the future, or potentially he's someone we'll see come up later as potentially the threat of the Enclave, as we heard about in the show, begins to unravel and become a more dominant threat once again. But also those are just my couple of pennies. Um, that is, some of that is a bit of conjecture theory, um, but I think it's quite well-founded, but that's just my view. And obviously the beginning bit was all fact and stuff we've seen from the Fallout TV show. I personally love the Fallout TV show. I'd love to hear your thoughts on all of this, either the video, the Fallout TV show, um, the fact my hairs look strange in this video, any of it.